morning, Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> I want to start off by saying to you guys that I am, first of all, I'm honored to be here. I'm happy to be here. I have traveled to cities and countries in six continents. The only continent that I have not visited is the Antarctic, and I don't think I'm going anytime soon. I say that for this reason. In all the places that I've been, and I've spent a lot of time in many of these places, I have never wanted to live anywhere except Detroit until I came to Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> this is a true story. It's not made up. It's real. I want to say to anybody out here who's in the field of architecture, please try and continue to preserve the integrity of this beautiful city. Old cobblestone streets, the row houses, it's all very beautiful and it's loving, not to mention the harbor. But what I also think is fascinating about this city is how you're centrally located in the central nervous system of the country, Washington, New York. I mean, think about that. What is so special about Baltimore and what is so special about other cities is what we want to be celebrating, not trying to be like everybody else. We have to kind of embrace that concept. So I love the fact that I am now running what is considered one of the best, most popular museums in the country, and I dare to say even in the world, the American Visionary Art Museum. No question about it. I, I have to get these things done before we talk about reverie, because I do want to talk to you about that. But I do want to say that what Rebecca Hofberger founded in this city is really unlike no other museum. I was at the conference in Denver, Colorado, the um, Alliance of American Museums. I heard so many times, that's my favorite museum, that's my favorite museum. I heard it so many times I began clocking it. 45 times I heard that in a three-day period in Denver, Colorado with museum professionals from all over the world. So that's something to really, really be proud about. And they're coming here next year. 4,000 people coming to the city of Baltimore. That's so exciting to me. <laughs> Reverie. Reverie is not only something that can be intriguing and focuses in the abstract, but reverie is what I live through metaphysics. And I'm gonna share, I don't wanna say throw out, I wanna share some principles that I think are important for us to really think about and embrace as we think about who we are, what we're giving, what we're contributing, and how we are being, right? That's important to think about. Not who am I, it's who are you being. We're human beings. And I want you to think about this. We are living in a time right now where the only thing that we can do now is be our best self. We have raped the planet. We have caused so much havoc in the various races, we have done so much harm and we're on the bottom and there's no place else to go but back up to the top. Life is acid and descent. That's the, that's the uh, normal cycle of things. But I want you to think about this. We are, and in this order, spirit, soul, and body. We have primarily and mostly only lived at the level of the body, which is on the lowest rung. And what am I really saying? I'm saying that what we're looking at now in the political world, educational world, in our climate, what we're looking at is what we have given to our creation. Now it's yielding back her fruits to us. We used to have to stay away from each other. Now we've got to stay out of the very air that we breathe. And that is who we are. You know, you breathing, to breathe is to be inspired. That's one of the definitions of the word breathe, is to be inspired. Have you ever thought about the fact that 
when we're no longer breathing, we have expired. I'm giving you principles to think about. I want you to think about the concept of abstract, intermediate, and concrete. Remember, I said that we are spirit, soul, and body. We have primarily lived from the level of the body. How do we elevate now to the level of the soul? Well, I want to say to you that that is the reason why so many people love the arts. And that is the reason why so many people love AVAM. AVAM is a museum that the artists are basically creating from the level of the soul. They have not been taught. They have not been trained and sat under somebody to teach them how to do what they do. They do it because they have to. They do it because something inherent is, is in them that's pushing them. And they don't give a damn if they sell it or not. They just have to do it. That's the art that you find in the American Visionary Art Museum. And there are many of you in here that do that, that have this kind of uh, rhythm when you're doing something that you love. My artistry happens to be business primarily, but it is an art. Now, I will say that when we're talking about this idea of creation and creativity, that is what we live in. We live in a world of creation. And so it makes sense that we're all little creators. We just don't always know or think that we're good enough because we're always measuring ourselves by somebody else or by what someone or how someone is critiquing what we're doing, you see? And it happens to be also very interesting and dynamic when we look at what's happening with the races. You know, when we look at how we thought we had come a lot further than what we had. And you want to just think about all the concepts and ideas that people have in their mind about being right. It's just an illusion. What you want to do, what we want to do, is we want to learn how to be, how to exist how to move from the level of just our, our physical bodies. And what I mean by that is food, we need that, okay? But we need it for something that happens inside of us. The whole idea of us uh, wanting to impress, you know, all these things are the level of the body because it's how you look, it's how you express yourself, it's how people think about you, but it's never really what you're building for yourself. And when we do that, when we start to focus on a higher level of ourself, we are automatically attractive to other people. People move towards you because they see something not outside of you, but something inside of you. So how am I living in reverie? Well, here's a quick little story for you. My first work was banking and finance. I took a wrong turn down the street in Detroit called Heidelberg. Here, an artist literally exploded on a street in the ghetto of Detroit. He literally picked up all the trash, dusted it off, added color, reconstructed it, and dared to call it art. <laughs> it was so controversial. Not only did the city tear him down twice, but it also was burned and he's still standing today. I married the guy. I still love him. <laughs> I did. <laughs> One year later, after turning down his street, it changed my life. I wrote my first poem when I was 18, before I was totally spoiled, but I wrote my next 350 after I met my husband, Tyree Guyton. And then this job at AVAM came up, I didn't apply, somebody put my name in the hat because apparently Rebecca had been watching me. I had been watching her too. <laughs> and I knew her before she started the museum in 1995. Anyway, one thing led to another. I was invited here and I was sleeping at the Royal Sinesta Hotel and I was awakened by a big bright light. I thought it was a street light. It was a star and I knew my life was going to change again. And my husband encouraged me to come. 
and I am here without him. <laughs> and, and it ain't all that bad. <laughs> I love my husband dearly, he's my best friend, but we are partners in this work. So someone said, well, how can you leave Detroit? Your work is there. I mean, you really, we transform that street into one of the most, um, what they call the most powerful art environments in the world. And I said, uh, leaving is, the, I didn't leave, it's just geography. I'm just coming and sharing now with Baltimoreans some of what it is that I have done and I'm learning from you. You know what I'm saying? And this is where I'm supposed to be now and that's why I suppose I really love your city. It's my city now too. So that is a taste, a tad. I don't have a clock and I can't see anybody because I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> but I will, <laughs> I will say that I, I think I might be within the time frame because I hope that you'll want to have some ex exchange and some dialogue. I know I, I share a lot of things. I said a lot of things. But I would really love to be able to talk to you more about how we're starting to now live at the level of the soul <laughs> and we are no longer as concerned about what people have to say about who we are and how we look and how we walk and how we talk. See, we got to move away from that and just do good work. With that, I thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a book right now by Dean Spade uh, called Mutual Aid, and um, it's, it's having me rethink a lot of like my own place as like an artist like navigating uh, sort of um, institutional opportunity. And I want to know as someone coming from a city uh, that has um, been rebirthed in such a way because of, of cooperative effort and mutual aid activity, how do you bring in those systems into a, a, a museum of all places that are typically so sort of um, colonial and, and non-cooperative? Like how, how do you bring in that spirit to the work that you do as a writer? I'm not sure I completely understand your question, so I'm gonna make it up. And if it's, <laughs> and if it's not working, you'll tell me, right? <laughs> Bringing the, how do I bring my spirit into AVAM, right? Is that what you're kind of like asking? What, what is it that I'm bringing into the museum? Um, so museums as a whole are typically very non-cooperative, right? Ah. And, and as someone that comes from that type of work in a city like Detroit, uh -huh. how do you um, sort of uh, change that narrative I got within, you now. A, within an arts institution? Sure. Okay, well, first of all, let me just say, that we're not talking the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, and I just find it fascinating when I was a little girl being in museums and, and they told me I couldn't chew gum and I was like, what can I do? This place is not for me. This is not my kind of place and so forth. So you're talking about breaking down those hierarchies, that elitism and, and see all of that is built around fear. It's all built around fear, but that is not what AVAM is. And that is not what the Heidelberg Project was. So I really didn't work in those stoic kinds of institutions. They were not for me. Now I'll admit that they were, we were very sexy to them. So of course, if you know you're popular, then they want to bring you in and have you try, try to get some of your swag, right? And try to break down some of those barriers. Because listen, the, tr the truth is, is that the way the young folks are now, they're not trying to have anybody curate their experiences for them. That's just the way that is. So the walls are being broken down already. What I go back to, I will always go back to, you do good work. People will find you. You have to be in, you know, real, authentic, and you just draw people to you. That's how, really, that's what really works, people. You know, I study the Bible not from the perspective of how to live my life. I study the Bible because it's full of metaphors and similes and things that really are so brilliant when you can unlock the mysteries. There's a scripture that talks about turning aside. Listen, negative and positive is necessary. It brings about light. Problems are meant to be solved. That's why they're called problems. 
The process of getting clothes clean in a washing machine is called agitating. Where are we going with this? Right? You got to find the balance. That's what it is. It's a balance in life, and you need them both because they're both teachers. And that's what we have to start catching on to. When someone poo poos you, <laughs> okay, got it. Thank you for that opinion. Let me see what I can extract out of it that might help me. But don't let it pull you down. That ain't happening. So just to get back to your question a little bit, we don't worry about them. We do our best work, and they'll come to you. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question, and it's a loaded question. And having a background in metaphysics, let me just say that you have a pattern in life that is based on threes. Ever looked at your finger? Ever looked at your arm? Ever looked at your leg? Did it ever occur to us that we only exist in land, air, and water? How about the fact that you can only talk in past, present, and future? How about the basic building block of an atom, a proton, a neutron, an electron? How about a cell being only a, a nucleus, a nucleolus, and a cell body? What's the rhythm? What's the pattern in life? It's all talking about how we're made. Now, the spirit is something that is emanating. The soul emanates from the spirit. And then the body emanates from the soul. You think about it in life. Everything works in principles of threes. Now that's our source. Ever try it? You say how people say, uh, I can't see it. I don't believe it. I'll put my hand over your mouth and your nose and watch you fight for something you can't see. <laughs> our air, right? Okay. And so therefore, you can't control that. That's called an involuntary act. You can't control the beat of your heart. Now, I want you to liken that to the spirit. So now, what can you control? Well, there are also voluntary functions that you can control, getting up and walking. But it's coming from the source, which is your head, that tells you to get up and walk. So I'm telling you that from the spirit, you have choices that you can make with this or that. And depending on what choice you make is telling you how you're handling the dictates that are coming from your spirit. Because see, the spirit gives you both. But then you have the choice to make. So that's why you see people who do horrendous things. They're operating on the left side or, or operating on an opposite side. Or you see people who are doing great things. And you also see fence straddlers. They do a little bit of both. They're not quite sure. But what I'm trying to get at is that the spirit is always going to be there. The only way that stops being there is when you stop breathing. But check it out. Check out how important the animation is in you. When you're dead and when you're gone, and people are looking, and they're upset, and they're saying he's gone. No, he's there. What's gone? The animation. That's why what's in you is more important than what is outside of you. That's why I said we've got to start learning how to live at the level of the soul. I hope that helps. Janine. 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 Sorry. No problem. Um, I wanted to ask you if you would share with us some ways that you physically, emotionally, and mentally move through difficult emotions like rage or anger, or what, what I think are difficult um, mm -hmm. emotions. Yes, that's so important because we've been catching it. African American people have been catching it. Listen, we, when we watch our boys being beat to death, that's rage. I had to come face to face with my own uh, trauma during the pandemic. 
Because I know these things doesn't mean I always am in practice of them. Okay, so I want to just let you know I'm right there with you. So the whole idea of us dealing with so many difficulties right now is once again the creation yielding back to us what we've put in it. So now we got to balance this thing out. And really what for me the way it starts, if I don't start my day with quiet meditation where you can't control the thoughts. They just come. They come flooding at you. That's another level of the spirit. You choose at the level of the soul, but the spirit is just going to be flooding you with information. And, you know, we're living in an age of information now. How do you temper that kind of information? It is a process of turning aside. Remember how I said we, that, that in the Bible, that was a scripture that Moses turned aside and that means not that you're turning, but what you're doing is you're leaving something that you can't figure out. I promise you, it will shake itself out. But you got to let it go. You got to leave it. You can't figure out everything because you're trying to be in control of everything. And that's partly why our world is in the condition that it's in. So you have to learn to turn aside of a problem that you can't figure out but it is solvable, and a lot of times it just comes when you're not expecting it. That's living at the level of the soul, okay? It's learning how to let go. It's learning how to relent, and then you let so much energy flow into you. Current, you know, you ride in the current. They said at the beginning, why is the water so important to us? You just ride that current, you know? That's the same principle with money, you know. It's meant to flow. It's true. First of all, I want to say as a fellow Detroit girl. Hey. Okay, <laughs> West Side School Crab and Pie. Okay, okay, I'm okay. West Side. <laughs> I am. <laughs> it's truly a pleasure and an honor to create this piece. Thank you. Um, what's showing up for me is in building strong teams, I find myself having a hard time balancing being and communicating to hold other folks accountable hmm. and being great and stable. Yeah, that's true. Um, so what does it look like for you to navigate that space? Well, someone told me when I got here, you know, you might have to fire your whole staff. Mm -hmm. I thought, really? Wow, that's interesting. You know, because, you know, when, <laughs> when new leadership comes in, you know, hey, I'm in control now, and I want all people who look like me. Control is a real powerful word, you know? And so I spend a lot of time looking, listening, learning. I am a humanitarian. I love people. And let me just throw this out here real quick. If you prick us all, we bleed red. If you prick us all, we bleed red. So we got a skin bag on, and that, remember, living at the level of the body? We let the skin bag influence us all the time. Principles have to be over personalities. You being honest with an individual, but not confrontational, is a start. It's just, here's what we're looking at. Here's what I like to see, or I think what the group likes to see, if it's a collaboration. And here's what, what's lacking. How can you help us get there? It's, it's, it's being non-confrontational and always being right there, grounded with someone else. Uh, and I think what people bristle up against a lot of times is when we're coming across as a hierarchy. So when I was told I may have to lose my whole staff I just thought, that's really interesting. Now, what the hell am I going to do, right? No, it's not, because everybody inherently has the principles that we're talking about in them. We're all human. We all have nine systems in our bodies. We all are operating according to attributes. So it's all possible. The key is learning how to move around and not just stay stuck in where you, what you think. It should be. 
you're welcome. But we got to practice these things. Like, the guys, I'm saying this is a practice, really. It's a practice at being, learning how to be better. We can do that. I think it's already happening. I really do. I don't know what it is, like I said, about the city, but I think y'all have been chosen. I really do. I mean, because I'm like, I never thought I'd be in Baltimore. I had family. I still haven't looked them up. <laughs> I, <laughs> I haven't found them. I don't know if I want to find them, but anyway. Um, but, you know, I just, I never thought that this is where I'd be, but I rode that current. I did. Thank you for saying that. When you speak about energy, mm -hmm. um, I think in, as a self-taught artist, I think there is kind of a renaissance in that field where it's accessible. Um, talking about that energy flow from soul and authenticity, do you think there is more of kind of like a cycle Oh, you know, I, um, I've learned how to um, practice being real, and I got a little lost with what you were saying because I left for a minute, and I apologize. <laughs> I really do. Um, and I can't even remember what you just said. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And what it is really is that it's not really happening from our effort. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, let me just say this. When I'm sitting down and I'm meditating, trying to quiet my thoughts, they never really get quiet. At some point, they might. I might find a little bit of quiet, but I don't fight it anymore. I used to fight it because I'm trying to get quiet. Every time we put that kind of energy into something, we're disturbing the natural flow. So if you can't get quiet, just sit with what, you're, what is happening. The important thing is acceptance. So when I'm connecting, for example, to my creative energy, let's say I can't write, I turn aside. Apparently, and listen guys, I love lyrics in songs and lines in movies. And I was watching The Crown, and I remember that the Queen's sister told, uh, what was her name, Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, she was like, I got to work. I just, I got to get this done. We've got to get this done. We've got to get this done. And the queen sister just says, well, we're going out riding. She's like, I can't come. I got to get this done. And she says, you know, if you just come, you might find you'll get your work done better because when you turn, your perspective broadens. And that was so beautiful to me because when we're stuck, what we do is we stay trying to figure out, trying to brainstorm. You've been in those rooms and you just feel tired and everybody's saying things in their mind, but they won't say it to the people that they're talking to. And you just, and it's just a real waste of time when you need, we need to stop and let the energy flow through us. It's a, it's a natural process. It is not a practice or rehearsed thing. It's just not. And, and the way you fall into it, you do fall into it. The way you flow into it is by letting go of your control. And that's not even that. It's a, that takes practice. 
That is what takes practice. Being open, being authentic, telling people the truth in a way that they can receive it is important because the whole country's built on a lie right now. And like I said, and she's yielding back to us what we've given her. Now we got to deal with that. That's yeah. real, people. We've got one more question over here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, is there a scripture or metaphor from the Bible that resonates with your spirit the most? Um, no. I uh, inhale every aspect of the Bible. And I do it because, like I said, I took Bible as literature in, in, in college and things like that. But now I, I have to say that through a process, I've, there's some things that have been really unlocked for me. And it's very important to me, just to me, that I see the metaphors and the similes for life. I'll give you one other example. Taking the natural things, for example, to understand something of the spirit. You know, one of the things that we do, we must eat in order to live. But in order for that to happen, something has to die. I don't care if you're eating plant-based, something still has to die in order for you to have life. That is a natural cycle. You can't fight the natural cycle. We didn't bring the creation in, we can't really save it. The best thing that we can do is be our best individual self. Nobody's going to live for you and no one's going to die for you. It's just being free and being yourself and trying to deal better and more authentic with your fellow man. I'm gonna say this, some people might not like it, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Yes, the scales have been unbalanced, horribly unbalanced, but it's not cool to make everybody else uncomfortable because you have been so uncomfortable. How do we balance the scales? Caucasian people don't really need to walk on eggshells because of the things that have happened in the past, but you do have an obligation to be honest and open and fair, and we all do. We all have to come from a place of real authenticity, not just saying the words, but really practicing it. That has to become a new way of life. We have done everything else, y'all. We're in the age of knowledge, artificial intelligence. Think about it. So, what manner, here's a scripture for you, of person ought you to be? Just food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think thank you. Thank you.